And we are live. Salaam alaikum, everybody. Yvonne here from My Halal Kitchen today with my very special guest and friend, Mubaraka Ibrahim of Fit Muslima. Salaam alaikum, Mubaraka. How are you? Wa alaikum salam. I am good. It is a beautiful spring day here in Connecticut. So if the weather is good, I am good. <laughs> Mashallah, West Coast, East Coast, we're bringing the country together today. <laughs> the last time we, we saw each other in person was in Washington, D.C. That was like four years ago, maybe? Yeah, I think it was four or five years ago, yeah. How, how the time flew. And that was a pretty cool meeting we had with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, talking about halal and women's health. Pretty yeah. cool opportunity. That was a yeah. lot of fun. Great day. And then we went to um, the ca cafe, Poets, what was it called? Um, oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Um, it's a famous <laughs> cafe, but I can't, the name. Yes, and the, the name is crazy. And it's crazy because every time I am in D.C., I make sure that I, me and my husband love going there. We go there every time we're in D.C. Um, but I, I can't remember the name. <laughs> Book, uh, but bus boys and Poets. Boys, yes. You're boys right. Yes. Yeah, we had a little lunch there, and then we were all running off because everybody had to to leave. But uh, yeah, we I never really uh, we never really got to dig deeper into that project. But uh, but alhamdulillah, it's so good to see you, and um, thank you for being here today. You're a very very busy, active woman, and um, mashallah, you had the idea. You're the one who gave me the idea to do this interview, talking about the. Um, the science of what happens when you're fasting uh, in Ramadan. So I look forward to asking lots of questions. Your your Instagram posts have lately have really piqued my interest, and in you're challenging you know a lot of the things that I thought I knew uh, about nutrition and you know the foods that we eat. So let me just do you a proper intro, and uh, then you can tell us a little bit more about yourself. You so much and your background and I want you to share a lot of that today so everybody please uh welcome uh, Mubaraka to the program today and if you're watching live please share this on your uh from the Facebook page and if you're watching the replay hit the subscribe button so you can see more interviews and hit the notifications button so you can see every time we get a new a new program coming up so without further ado Mubaraka Ibrahim is an internationally known health and fitness expert and Muslim American businesswoman. She has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show, covers and business features of the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times and fitness features in Prevention, Aziza Magazine, I remember that one, and Experience Life Magazines. Her efforts as both a health and fitness educator and Muslim businesswoman has afforded her the opportunity to be invited as a special guest to the White House Iftar dinner by President Barack Obama in both 2012 and 13, and the honor of sitting directly next to the president. Mashallah. And there's so much more about you that I, I'm not saying here. So people can definitely go to your Instagram at Fit Muslima uh, and see more about that. But Murwadika, tell us more about you, your passion for health and women's health in particular, fitness, nutrition, and the floor is yours. So I am really passionate about health and wellness, particularly passionate about Muslim women taking control of their health and wellness. Mm -hmm. My passion actually comes from not a family that was uh, dedicated to health and fitness, but rather seeing the uh, the preventable illnesses that my pam my mother, my father, relatives went through. My mother was a type two diabetic, mm -hmm. and she suffered from uncontrolled diabetes for 30 years, wow. not from a lack of trying what we thought was just her being hard-headed, right? <laughs> we right. discovered far too late that she literally was never taught how to eat, how to move, how to manage stress, how having diabetes actually affected her life and the things that she could and couldn't eat. Mm -hmm. She literally had no idea. I didn't discover this until she had diabetes for 25 years. And after having it for 25 years, 
one of her many times being hospitalized for uh, extremely high blood sugar levels, they finally referred her to a dietitian. And at that point, I had actually had a fitness studio and I was teaching health and wellness. I was an adult. Um, she got diabetes in, uh, the, initially when I was seven. So mo pretty much all of my memorable life, she's had diabetes. And it wasn't until that point when she called me and she said, well, the doctor referred me to a dietitian. Do I, you think I should go? And I said, you've had diabetes for 25 years. Nobody ever sent you to a dietitian. She's like, no. <laughs> and it's just complications, but no nutritional counseling. Right. It was literally just, hey, you have diabetes. The doctor literally said, this is your prescription. Take these needles three times a day and stop drinking Pepsi. That was his instruction. <laughs> She wow. had no idea about anything. Five years. So, and and as we know, diabetes is a very uh, internally destructive yeah. uh, disease. So her body had been going through a yeah, lot. Yeah. And by the time she actually went to a dietitian, she already had heart disease. She already had neuropathy. Her glaucoma had began to accelerate. And, you know, a couple of short years, I think about two and a half years after that particular hospitalization, she had a major stroke and she only lived for 18 months after that. So she passed away from the side effects of diabetes or hemophilia. And so I'm really, really passionate. So that's why I talk a lot about insulin resistance, a lot yeah, of type 2 diabetes, and I am really, really focused on the science of it, right? So my background, my educational background is I have an interdisciplinary bachelor's degree in exercise science, public health, and psychology, and 13 fitness and nutrition certifications. Wow. And I choose to really focus on insulin resistance in terms of health and wellness because diabetes is an epidemic. It was a pan, it was literally yeah. a epidemic before COVID came over and took that word. <laughs> the World Health Organization actually uh, designated it as a pandemic before in the world, before COVID was wow. involved. I um, didn't know that. Yeah, and so it is that, it's that important, like it, it, yeah. statistically one in three Americans have some form of insulin resistance. That's significant. That's really significant. Okay. So really and have major efforts because it's something that can be prevented and avoided and reversed. So in it all can, you can do it all with food, which is why this is a great platform to talk yes. about. <laughs> yes, it is. And I... I, I never, I don't, you know, get into the intricacies of the science. That's why I'm, I'm looking for your expertise. But I, I really enjoy your Instagram posts, and I don't always make comments because I don't feel, um, you know, like I really like know what to even ask sometimes. But uh, I appreciate the fact that you're, you're very, um, you're, you're very cognizant of uh, sugar intake, proper, you know, um, proper forms of sugar versus like, I should say proper, but um, uh, misunderstood forms of sugar, I should say, um, you know, trying to get people to really understand truths versus myths on, on that. And there's so much information that we don't know we don't need. And you give that to us by saying, hey, you know, you're opening up a whole topic of discussion that we didn't even know we really needed. And I have to say, you are the first Muslim woman that I ever saw working out online. I never saw, I, I, when I first started covering and, and became Muslim, I thought, you know, I used to be very athletic and then I stopped because I thought how, how to do this outside or, you know, you really, I have to say, you know, you really opened my eyes to the fact that we have to keep moving, you know, regardless of recover or whatever. Um, but, but you also, you did it in such a way, or you still do it in such a way that is modest and doable, and you're addressing like very specific needs of Muslim women. Mm -hmm. So I, I encourage anybody who's watching right now to head over to Mubaraka's Instagram page and just like it, come back and watch the interview, and then you know, <laughs> you know, pay attention to all of her really informative and educational um, posts that she makes that we can all benefit from, even if you're not diabetic or, you know, I was pre-diabetic a few mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Never thought that would happen to me because I don't 
eat a lot of junk food, but it was stress related. Mm, yeah. It was low vitamin D related. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really careful now about, you know, it's not just about having a piece of cake or whatever. It's more uh, also making sure I'm working out, making sure that I'm managing my stress yeah. and vitamin D. So, so I'm all ears uh, <laughs> to listen to you today. So uh, we're, Ramadan is upon us and we are going to be fasting. Some people may not be able to fast. Some people are new to uh, the fasting, uh, you know, uh, program. There's so much talk about fasting in general today, more than there ever was before. Uh, mm -hmm. There's intermittent fasting, there's dry fasting. So let's just jump in um, and, and talk a little bit about, you know, what are, what are, what, what benefits do our, does our body go through when we do fasting? And what is that difference between intermittent and dry and all, all of that? Well, tell us more. So fasting is a buzzword now, right? So we hear a lot about intermittent fasting and all of the benefits of intermittent fasting, and it is a quote unquote new science. But alhamdulillah, as Muslims, we know that fasting has been prescribed since mankind <laughs> has been created. So it right. is um, millennials year, year old uh, um way of us doing both physical and spiritual purification. So the important thing, and this is one of the things that I really try to get everyone to understand during the month of Ramadan, particularly when we talk about intermittent fasting, which lots of people do. You know, I talk about it all year long. I think that it is something that can benefit just about everybody, not everybody, but just about everybody. And I encourage my clients to do intermittent fasting. But when we talk in general about intermittent fasting, if you read an article about intermittent fasting that's written as a general guide, they're talking about what science considers wet fasting. So a lot of the research is done on what happens if you abstain for, from food, but you still drink water along the way, right? So this is not the same as what we do in the month of Ramadan, right? Scientifically, when they look at the research, right, when researchers need to identify exactly what people are doing, the type of fasting that we are doing in Ramadan is called dry fasting. That means we don't drink any liquids during our fasting hours. Now, the great news is that there are hundreds of research studies actually on Muslims and the effect of fasting on our health. Why? Because it's kind of difficult. The, the most difficult part of a scientific study is to keep the participants actually engaged in the complete study. But mm -hmm. Muslims just happen to be the perfect test subjects around fasting because we're obligated to fast. We're not going to give up halfway through Ramadan and be like, I don't want to finish the study. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, there is some willpower in there. So. <laughs> right. So we get a little crabby at times, but we do it. <laughs> yes, they just follow us during Ramadan and that's the length of the study. <laughs> most people are so, so in awe of the fact they say, and what's the most common thing you hear when you talk about fasting to people who don't fast the way we do this? Not oh, even a day of water. Right. That's like the most common thing people say. And you're like, no, not even. So, right. right. Yes. Yeah. So dry fasting actually. So, so, so it may come as a surprise to some people that studying or understanding how fasting during Ramadan affects health of Muslims is actually very well documented in the research because of this. This was, was actually reiterated and brought to my attention. Again, I went to a conference about, it was right before COVID hit, so like 2019, and it was a conference at, um, actually about, by researchers about intermittent fasting. And one of the researchers who were not Muslim, she got up and she, in the beginning of her lecture, she talked about what piqued her interest around the effects of fasting is her Muslim patients. She said oh. during Ramadan, she would take them off of all of their medications if they had diabetes or high blood pressure. She said they didn't need their medications at all wow. during the entire month. But as soon as Ramadan was over, they needed to go back on their medications. 
she was like, and that piqued her interest. Like, what? How can you not wow. eat what you say and it actually improve your health where you don't need your medication? But then when you go back to eating during the day, you need your medication again. And that actually wow. her research interests. And I sat there, and of course, as a Muslim, I'm both impressed and embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> what right? is it? Because because you know it's like bad diet or something or what? so it's a little bit of both right it's a little bit of what they're eating and also how often that they're eating right mm -hmm. so when right. we talk about the basics so this is before we get into the actual effect of dry fasting and how it actually accelerates the fat the the effects of wet fasting mm -hmm. we know that from the research that when you eat seems to be even more important than what you eat. Wow. So eating more often leads to disease as opposed to eating in a time window. So there's um, a wonderful book. I suggest it all the time. It's called The Circadian Code, right? It's by uh, <laughs> author and researcher Sachin Panda. And in his research, he actually took two groups of mice and one group of mice, he, and he gave both of them what is considered the standard American diet in terms of their macronutrients, yeah. right? So a standard yeah. American diet means that it's both high carb and high fat. The combination of those two things is really bad for our health. So that's what makes the standard American diet so bad. Not that it's high fat, not that it's high carb, it's that it's both of those two things together. So what about the quality of those carbs and, and fats? So in this research right. study in particular, they actually took the worst quality. They took a standard American diet in terms of the quality and the macronutrient and calorie breakdown. Mm -hmm. And they gave one group of mice, they put these um, this, the food inside of the cage and let them graze all day, all night, no restrictions. They took the other group of mice, they gave them the exact same amount of food, but they only gave it to them in a 12-hour period, and then they took it away for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. By the end of the 16 weeks, the mice w that grazed all day long all developed diabetes, heart disease, oh, high wow. blood pressure, all of those things. The mice who only was eating for 12 hours a day, eating the exact same thing, eating a bad diet, a sad diet, they did not develop any of those diseases. This mm -hmm. is, and this type of research has been redone. So I'm not saying it's okay to eat junk food and eat crazy if you right. fast. <laughs> but what I am saying is that if there is a choice, if you have no other choice, and I tell this to my clients all the time, fasting is always the default. You can be, improve mm -hmm. your health by right. not going to fast. And you know, when you think about the research done on Muslim communities, we actually reiterate and repeat this exact same study that's done on mice because we know Ramadan is not the healthiest time of eating. <laughs> Even right. if you eat healthy, right. healthy the rest of the time of the year, Ramadan is when you're going to eat the worst. But despite that, when they look at the health outcome of Muslim communities during the month of Ramadan, just about every health marker improves, irregardless of how we're eating in the evening time. Wow. That's how powerful fasting is for yeah. our body. Is it because our bodies are getting a break? You know, the digestive system is getting a break. Is that, does it have a lot to do with it? That actually the most important mechanism. So a lot of things happen to our body when we fast. But the most important mechanism is our insulin level lowers. That is literally the linchpin. We have a lot of other things that happens when we're fast. Autophagy is one of the major things that happens when you do fasting. And mm -hmm. autophagy is literally like, I love autophagy because it's an amazing mechanism in our body, right? Oh, so and please, I, yeah, please I explain that. 
Yes, I like to describe autophagy as our body's own recycle center, right? So detox is also a really, a really uh, um, a buzzword. Right. But the truth is nothing detoxes you on a cellular level like autophagy does. One, our body detoxes all the time. We don't need to do anything to detox. We can do things to help um, facilitate that process. But to accelerate it, the only thing that the science shows that us accelerated is to actually get ourselves an autophagy. And the only way you can get an autophagy is by lowering your insulin level. Autophagy does not increase. It literally is a teeter-totter with insulin level. When your insulin, your blood sugar, if, if that's a better way for people to understand it, goes down, autophagy goes up. When your insulin and blood sugar goes up, autophagy goes down. It's literally a teeter-totter. So the first thing that happens when we are doing fasting is our insulin level decreases. Once your insulin level decreases, it opens up a whole world of benefits. It decreases inflammation. It increases autophagy. It increases fat burn, right? So we have all of these things. They even show that it actually increases your metabolism. Not, I'm sorry, not your metabolism, your immune system. So oh. all of these things happen when we lower our insulin level and allow our body to heal itself, right? So one of the reasons why that happened is because we are going without food. Because one of the uh, automatic mechanisms of your body is that every time you eat a meal, doesn't matter if you have diabetes or no diabetes, insulin resistance or no insulin resistance, everybody's insulin level goes up when you um, eat a meal. Your insulin goes up because that is the way your body begins the process of metabolizing the meal. And it doesn't, and this does not matter whether or not you're eating a low carb meal, a keto meal, a high carb meal, doesn't matter what you're eating, your insulin level will go up. Now, how high it goes up depends on what's on your plate, but everybody insulin level rises when they eat. Well, if your insulin level is constantly rising, which is one of the reasons why, if you think earlier when we talked about uh, the study with the mice and how the insulin level, if, if, think about it, if you, if every time your insulin level rises, your detoxification lowers, every time your insulin level rises, you also rise your all of the inflammation in your body. If your insulin level rises, then you decreases your immune system. If that's happening all day long, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, that is what leads to disease, as the mice study has showed us. Havoc but, in your body. It's wreaking right. havoc. Yes, it's wreaking havoc on your body, which is why I tell people all the time, eat full meals, don't snack in between, right? That's the best thing that you can do to get started. Don't snack. Just eat a meal. Go time without eating. You shouldn't be eating every two to three hours. That's actually not only is it not natural for your body, it's actually detrimental for your health for you to have eat every two to three hours. You know, um, can I just stop you there for one moment? Um, this this brings me to uh, some questions about and, and maybe you can address that afterwards. But um, so when we're not fasting you know, having, having a schedule and a rhythm of eating. I know when I was in Italy, um, my family, I have family there. I, I felt like so much healthier when that, because there's a time for breakfast and then there's, you know, nobody's eating anything. And then there's the meal time for lunch, mm. middle of the day, everyone's eating at the same time. I mean, we, we tend to say, well, it's great because everybody's eating together. Um, but moreover, there's a schedule. And then do you go without eating? Maybe you would have a yogurt in between or something, or maybe an ice cream, not every day, but once a week or something. Uh, then you'd have a, a little sandwich or something before, um, and maybe it would be late at night. But the, the, the levels of diabetes and heart disease and all of that is like totally different than here. And I, and I, and I always thought, what is it about the, those societies who have that, that schedule of eating Mm -hmm. um, and they, they go long time without eating anything in between. There's no snacking. There's not, mm -hmm. they're not grabbing for chips. They're not grabbing for candy bars. There's, there's no d desire for it because they're looking forward to that nice family meal or whatever. But it always struck me that um, not having a, a set schedule here as a country mm -hmm. is 
detrimental to our health. Whereas like in other parts of the world, the whole country kind of stops at the same time, which is what I love about Ramadan because that is the one time that we are on a schedule. Yeah, yeah. What, what, do you, what do you what do you have to say about that? Like, what do you think about? I that? think that one of the benefits of it's not only one, it's not snacking between meals that makes a big difference, but also the quality of foods are very different in other countries than in the sure. United States, right? Like of in course. Europe, they have banned things that we eat on an everyday basis. Right? Exactly. So it's both the quality. Another topic. <laughs> Yes, that's a whole other topic. It's both the quality of food. It is more people eat home cooked meals, right? Yes. That's a yeah. huge difference. Yeah. You're eating less chemicals and less additives. Uh, you have places that are more local, right? How many yeah. people? How many of us have ever been to the farm that we get our meat from, or the farm that yeah. we get vegetables from, right? Yeah. Is it? You know, we don't go to most people actually don't go to farmers markets in the United States. No, we should, mm -hmm. and it will be much more beneficial for us. But most of us don't. So I think that it's a combination of all of those things, as mm -hmm. well as the social environment that yes. happens around mm -hmm. us. We can't definitely we know now probably more than ever since we've had to quarantine during the pandemic, how important our social health is. Yes. So I think it's mental health. All of those things. Yep. I think also there's a sort of cer a certain sense of of um, safety and security and knowing that um, at a certain time of day, you're going to be having a meal with the people you love and care about. There's maybe that even relaxes our, our stress hormones. I don't know. <laughs> Have they ever just said more? Sure. <laughs> it's a sense that um, you're not going to be scrambling for your meal and, you know, you're going to be kind of, um, you know, comforted with, with that food and social uh, gathering. And I think that's what we also have in Ramadan typically. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's yeah. Parallel to that. So yeah. 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 Okay. Ramadan, thanks. Ramadan changes so much for us. And I think that Part of it is the physical benefit we get is from the fasting itself. But I do believe like far, part of that physical benefit is also about the social. What I love about Ramadan the most is that it's literally the only time of year where we undeniable intertwine physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. Like you're yeah. literally doing something physical for your spiritual well-being. Mm -hmm. And you don't do that physical thing right it is going to affect the spiritual well-being it's going to affect your ability to fast yeah. it's going yeah. to affect how much bad you can do during the night right it's going to affect yeah. your energy level right so yeah. all of it is intricately intertwined during ramadan well what what's the what's the science of what happens physically to our bodies when we abstain from food. It seems like counterintuitive that uh, our immune system would get stronger when we fast, mm -hmm. right? You think that the, the irony is like, you know, we would think that food would kind of uh, strengthen us and it does, but this, you know, abstaining for that sort of period, like what is the, what's, what's chemically going on? What's, you know, what's, what is the science of that? It's so fascinating to know. It's so amazing. Our bodies have it, it our bodies is literally such a perfect machine made with, with such hikma, right? So I guess this is why I love exercise science, right? <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of hikma in there. Because Wisdom. if we think about it like this, like our body literally have default mechanisms so that human beings can survive any place on earth. The reason why we tend to have these assumptions about, oh, our body is going to get dehydrated. Oh, our body is going to get, uh, we're going to be uh, not nourished during Ramadan is because one, we are used to our modern day environment where we can open up the refrigerator in Connecticut and get a coconut from South America, right? <laughs> Like, what do I do if I can't do that, right? So one, we don't think in the matter of how would my body survive if I actually lived off of nature? Our body is designed to first yeah. to survive. 
and in fact, to thrive, right? And so what the science is found, finding is absolutely fascinating. It's fascinating even the researchers because every time they go into a research with one assumption, the body completely does something absolutely different. So one of the things, so there is one recent research study that was done, that was published about 18 months ago. And they actually looked at what happens if you dry fast it for five consecutive days. Now, as Muslims, we don't fast for five consecutive days, right? We break fast in the evening time. But what it did was it gave researchers a look into how our body actually reacts when we don't drink water in addition to not drinking food. And what they find, found is they expected for people to get dehydrated, right? Mm -hmm. And what they actually found is that people did not get dehydrated. The body actually began to recycle its own water to maintain hydration. Now, this doesn't mean you don't need to drink water during Ramadan. Obviously, you should continue to drink water, but it also means that you really don't need to do a whole bunch of extra stuff, right? right. I saw your Instagram post about that. Yes. About, that was fascinating. I'll try to... Absolutely. I was, I was fascinated about that. I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, a lot of really created us. He's like, I got you. You going to do this for me? I got oh. you. Yeah, I, 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 I want to really want you to elaborate on that because I, I think uh, I've always uh, encouraged people, you know, make sure you're drinking coconut water or water, or, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables at iftar time. Like, I think there's a little bit of nervousness inside. And I know it's inside of me when I, one of the first fasts I ever did was winter. So it was really short, but when it became to summer, uh, mm -hmm. I got kind of internally um, freaked out the first time I ever fasted Ramadan because I was like, oh my God, I'm going to collapse in the street or something. Like I just I remember, never, I remember that summer. I so remember that. <laughs> I was like, and I have to say, so I will be completely transparent. This was even, even counterintuitive to me. So that yeah. was probably, what was it? Four or five years ago where we were fasting in July. And I was yeah. the same way. I was like, everybody drink water. Remember to drink your water. I was like posting like, no more Ramadan. It's been Ramadan. Remember to drink your water. Yeah. This research is, is recent research in the last two years. And it literally turned us on our head and like, okay, well, we didn't need to go overboard. We can just drink regular water the way that we normally do. So not only have they done this research, this recent research about dry fasting, but they've actually done research where they looked at whole Muslims communities, literally followed hundreds of Muslims during the month of Ramadan, specifically to test if they became dehydrated. One research study in particular, I believe they looked at 130 Muslims in Malaysia and not, not dictating what they eat or anything. They just wanted to test their urine, their blood, certain um, um, biomechanisms to see if they had any dehydration. And throughout the entire month of Ramadan, on average, they did not become dehydrated. There was not doing anything extra. And it was really, it's really, it always shocks the researchers, right? And it actually shocked a lot of us who are into health and wellness. So here's the interesting thing, the reason why it becomes, it changes. When you're doing wet fasting, your body is taken in water and your body knows it's taken in water. And you can actually drink too much water because when your body takes in water, it actually dilutes the sodium in your system, right? right. So that is actually, yeah. and too much of that can be dangerous. Right. When you're not drinking and drinking water, Instead of those cells releasing water and then putting it out via sweat, via urine, your body detects that it's not bringing in water. And when the water leaves the cells, your body literally recycles it and sends it back. So you're actually not depleting sodium the way you are if you actually drunk water. Your body has been has an internal mechanism to detect 
whether or not you are doing a wet fast or dry fast, apparently. When you're doing a dry fast, it actually recycles the water in your system. And so for us as Muslims, obviously we're not doing five consecutive days of fasting. We're doing only fasting during you know, 12, 14, maybe 16 hours, depending on where you are in the world. And so at the end of that, you can now rehydrate, get your water back in your system. And then when you go throughout your day and you start getting a, and you start needing water, your body is literally taking the water that you drunk at night and it's recycling it in your system to prevent you from being dehydrated. Now, do Muslims become dehydrated during Ramadan? I am sure there's a small percentage of people, because I know there's going to be somebody that says, well, I passed out. I did this. Generally, that is for people who aren't conscious, who aren't drinking water, right? So I'm not saying don't drink water during Ramadan. Definitely drink water. Definitely eat some high water uh, fruits and vegetables to keep your system hydrated. But we don't need to drink electrolytes or even I would say even have coconut water, which by the way, doesn't really hydrate you. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you said that in your, in your, uh, your Instagram reel, like, you know, basically, and it kind of calmed me down a lot. Cause it was, you were saying, you know, just kind of be normal. Like yeah. when you, when you yeah. break your fast, drink as normal. And I think what happens is like a lot of times I'm like, oh my God, I need to get drinking so much water. Where's the watermelon and where's the smoothies? And it's, it's, uh, that's not how we're supposed to be anyway, right? Like this isn't how our deen was set up. It's not the reason Allah gave us Ramadan to be, you know, neurotic and right. no, right? It, it's, it's so interesting, but you, but you, but you're also commanded to break the fast, mm -hmm. which means that do, eat, do, drink as normal, right? And and what you're saying, all the science backs up the the spiritual that we're 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 told, you know, the rhythm, the 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 kind of rituals of Ramadan. Everything you're saying mm -hmm. um is making sense on a spiritual level too. Like everything I've ever learned and studied about the Islamic way of fasting and Ramadan, like I would think before, but okay, but but if you live in a really dry climate or what about your kidneys? You know, like I would think about these things. I, I get nervous, like, but, but my kidneys maybe can't handle, you know, uh, maybe I didn't drink enough at Sahur. Uh, and then during the day, but I've never, it's really weird. I've personally never had like kidney aches or anything in Ramadan. The last Ramadan, I didn't, I, I like, didn't feel any of that. Uh, but when I'm not fasting, I realize sometimes I don't drink enough water. Like I have more issues sometimes with saying, oh, I really need to drink water. I can tell by my kidneys, they, they, they hurt a little bit. And I know for me, that means I need to drink water, but I don't experience that in Ramadan. It's really weird. I'm the last, see, mercy. Allah says, win every difficulty there is ease. <laughs> yeah, I, I think what 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 the, the, the science that you're discussing and the, and the, the things you've been putting out there have been, um, eye-opening for me and and they're really settling my heart <laughs> uh, because you know we have to trust right we have to trust a lot what Allah tells us is the right thing to do yeah. don't question you know every little thing but but the science is kind of um reassuring <laughs> yes. 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 thank you thank yes. you for so so that that brings me to the question of when you're not fasting um what is, uh, is everybody just different in their hydration needs or mm -hmm. so yeah. what, what should we do? So my base recommendation is whatever you weigh in pounds, divide that number in half and drink that many ounces of water a day. So whatever you weigh, drink that many ounces. Of, and that's just a base amount, right? If it's summertime and you're sweating a lot, increases a little bit. If you're doing a super hard workout or you're going for a two hour hike, obviously you should increase it more if you're doing those things that's going to make you sweat more. But as a base, whatever you weigh. So for people who don't deal in pounds, just go use a conversion, take your weight, turn it into pounds, divide that number in half. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you should be drinking 100 ounces of water a day. 
That is how much you should be drinking. So a person who's 350 pounds should not be drinking the same amount as somebody who's 150 pounds. You actually drink according to your weight. But isn't it also, I mean, Ramadan is such a time of being conscious about uh, ourselves and, and going inward in our relationship with an all, Allah and all of that. But it should be a reflective time. But I would, I would think it would also mean that we pay more attention to our bodies too. So isn't it also like, you know, sometimes we don't realize that we're thirsty. I think you, you can pay attention to your body. <laughs> Sorry? Forced to pay attention to our body. Okay. Attention, right? So listen to what your body's saying when it's time to eat and drink that like, you know, don't just drink because you think you have to and your body's not going to regulate itself. Drink what? because... One of the things that also too about just drinking water is you, we should actually only be drinking small amounts, right? So again, going back to the research, our body only has the ability to actually absorb and use about 20 ounces of water an hour. So most people, they increase their water amount and they're like, oh, but I have to go to the bathroom all the time. Generally, that happens because they'll sit down and they will drink a whole 32 ounce bottle of water, right? In one, right. In, in a half an hour, they're just sitting and they're drinking, right. drinking, drinking. Well, at, certain, at a certain point, your cells become saturated, your muscle fibers become saturated and your body is like, well, I can't do anything else with all of this extra water. So I'm going to send it to the kidneys to get rid of it. So in mm -hmm. order for you to actually hydrate, so that's what I call people who are, they are water drinkers, but they're still not hydrated, right? So when I say mm -hmm. drink half your body weight in water, so that person that's 200 pounds drinking 100 ounces of water, if you're drinking a, and you're like, oh, well, I wake up at six o'clock and by 12 o'clock, I got my 100 ounces in, you're not hydrated because you drunk it too close together. You're going to oh. pee it out. You, you should drink small amounts of water. Small amounts throughout the day when you're not oh. fasting. And the great thing about Ramadan is you can actually just pair your 15 or 20 ounces of water with each one of the significant uh, rituals and prayers that we have throughout the evening, right? So if you break your fast with 20 right. ounces of water and then you wait until it's time for dinner, generally for most people, that's going to be 45 minutes, some people an hour, right? Then you drink another uh, 20 ounces. And then you drink another 20 when you go pray Isha. For most people, that's another hour. Then you drink another um, 20 ounces when you go to make tarwi, right? And then the mm -hmm. first part of tarwi is normally about an hour long, particularly in the first part of Ramadan, right? Drink between the yeah. salah and then drink before you go to bed. You can actually get it all in if you start pairing it with all of the things that we do during the month of Ramadan. And then you have- That's no really- helpful and interesting and it's the opposite of the food right like you drink small amounts of water but never do that with food yes <laughs> yes <laughs> small amounts of water snack on water i guess we could say <laughs> well sometimes we think we're hungry but we're actually thirsty absolutely yep right? so yeah. um that that is really fascinating i think and i always wondered like you know how much water should i drink and when and you know that's actually a really good rule of thumb I'm going to put that in my notes and, uh, you know, make sure that that's shared because that's helpful. You know, you can get water bottles now that tell you how many ounces you're drinking. And, you know, like you said, I mean, with every prayer, with the meal, I mean, and what about suhoor time? Yes, definitely. You can drink, drink water during that time. But if we want to think about, so suhoor becomes a really important meal for us, particularly living in the West, right? Because one of the things about living in the West, and I'm sure some Eastern countries, but more so in the West, nothing slows down for us, right? <laughs> we are <laughs> <laughs> okay. You still got to go to work. You still got to go to school. You're still expected to show up for a business meeting. You're still expected to get the project complete, right? Nothing slows down. No. You don't need to go home in the middle of the day and take a nap. Right. No, no. Although I do try to sneak in my power naps. Right. So right. having Sahor in the morning, you understand the hikmah of the prophet, uh, the, the wisdom of his suggestion of 
always wake up for the morning meal, even if all you have is water, right? So yes. that really gives us a large leeway of what we can do. But my recommendation for Sohor is that definitely you should try to wake up and have Sohor every single morning. And the most important thing, two things that is the most important part of your Sohor meal is fat and protein right? So when we think about Sohor on a practical level, right, this is the meal that we want to sustain us as long as possible. We're, nev we're not going to get through the whole Ramadan without ever feeling a hunger pain. Right. Even I mean, we are going to get hungry, right? right. <laughs> but more than hunger, I think for most people, they want to keep energy, right? You want to just be yeah. able to do the things that you need to do to get through your day without it feeling like you are completely fatigued or exhausted, right? Or crashed. That right. crash is crash, crash, right? right? And yeah. the way we do that is food is an energy source, right? And yeah. you want to focus on the foods that is going to give you energy for the longest amount of time during your day. And if we look at it in that way, we see that people who eat fat and protein in the morning have more energy throughout the day because it takes longer for your body to break down and process those two particular things as, per, as opposed to carbohydrates. And so your body is feeding your energy, feeding your muscles for a longer period during the day, right? So if we right. just look at the practical science of it, if you woke up in the morning and you had pancakes or you had oatmeal or you had some toast, right? We know that grains completely metabolize out your system in one to two hours, right? Two hours max, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you are eating Sahur at five o'clock in the morning, by 8 a.m., you no longer have the energy from those pancakes. <laughs> right. They've already been digested and you're gone, right? You know, right. Like, even if you ate whole wheat toast, even if it's whole wheat, by 8 a.m. is gone. You're not right. working off energy from your whole wheat toast from Sahur. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> but protein actually stays in your system for as long as four hours. And then when you add fat to your meal, fat actually slows the digestion slightly. So you may be able to get another hour out of that meal and not slow the digestion in a negative way, right? So people get, get nervous when I say your digestion is slowing, but in a positive way where it allows the food to one, feed your muscles and your energy level for a longer period of time. And it allows your body to actually absorb additional nutrients from that food. Because the longer the food is in your system, the more nutrients it's going to pull out. One of the reasons why animal proteins stay in our system longer is because it is more things for our body to pull out from it. So our body is actually using it for a longer period of time. So when you think of waking up and what is going to be the best meal that is going to keep my teenagers energized, right? They still have to go to school. That is going to make sure that I can be alert during my morning meeting, right? All right. of these things is what we think about when we think about Sohor. Well, you want to think about, so not giving specifics because people are in different areas of the world. And so um, even if I tell you, hey, have an avocado, I said that online and somebody like three people messaged me and said, what can I have else? Because they don't have avocados where I live. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Can you tell me something else? Well, so think about fat, think about protein. If you choose to have oatmeal or have, you know, any other type of grain in the morning, just know that the things you want to focus on is the fat and protein and everything else is an accessory, right? So mm -hmm. last year, I think there was an obsession with all of the bloggers telling people to eat avocado toast for Sahur. I don't know why. I just kept seeing it. I was like, what is it with this avocado toast? Avocado toast. <laughs> <laughs> to their credit, the fat in avocado toast is okay. going to actually help you more than the toast. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I don't know. It's, 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 it's out here in California, avocado toast is like thirteen dollars for a. Oh my gosh! Really? 
that. So I, every time I hear that, I just roll my eyes because I'm like, how much is an avocado? Oh my gosh. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> anyway, but, um, yeah, that's, but yeah, so that's what I tell people. Think about so some really great foods that are really universal foods is like an egg in the morning yeah. is great. Mm -hmm. And not just an egg white, the whole egg. Remember, oh, yeah. you're trying to get the fat. An egg is perfect. The yep. yolk is the fat. The white is your protein. That in the morning is going to give you sustained energy, right? Mm -hmm. it, and think about, I tell people also, you don't have to have traditional breakfast at Sahur. Right. Have some of the chicken and vegetable stir fry you had the night before. That's what I do. Yes. That's exactly it will, what I do. I, much longer than you trying to have cereal or even a smoothie. Yeah, my, my body loves that kind of stuff. Like, I, you know, I, I kind of got used to that in Suhoor. And also from, you know, being like in other countries at breakfast time, I noticed that they do a lot more protein than we do here. We do a lot of buddy things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can have like fish <laughs> for Suhoor. <laughs> I can have that leftover meat. Uh, I do a lot of eggs. But I've always done this in the last three, four years. And I noticed that fasting is a lot easier for me. And I don't feel, I don't feel shaky. I don't feel, um, I don't feel like crashing. I don't feel irritable. I'm still hungry by the time iftar comes, but yes. that's fine. I mean, that's normal, but it yes. just doesn't wreak havoc on my system for some reason. Right, right. I think the hunger is not as big of an issue if you still have energy, if you can still right. focus, if right. you can still get your yeah, stuff focus. right, right? right. right? It's when you lose energy and focus and fatigue actually set in. Yeah. Like, okay, wait yeah. a minute. So, because you can't work, you can't function. And, you know, it's that last hour before Sahur, and you're like, I mean, before Iftar, and you're like on your couch going, oh my God, oh my God, I can't touch right, 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 And then you don't right. make anything for Iftar. It just ruins your whole uh, yeah. you know, uh, situation going on. So that yeah. does set the tone for the rest of the, the day. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's not actually breakfast. That's the thing. So who is not really right? You should think about it as I always think about it as nourishment, right? Right. So we're thinking about meals in a little bit of a different way, right? So right. I right. need to think about what I need to eat to actually nourish my body, not just to tickle my taste buds, <laughs> right? right? So I think and we get thrown off. that fat and that protein. Yeah, I think we get thrown off because it's the for a lot of people, it's uh, the meal they're they're eating when they've woken up from sleeping, it's that early morning thing. So we associate that with the breakfast, but it doesn't have to mean the same food. In fact, it probably shouldn't in, in, from what you're saying. And I think, uh, you know, people know their own bodies and they can tell the difference, um, you know, how, and how they feel. You know, maybe, would you think, do you think journaling is a good thing for people to do if they're, if they're trying to monitor, um, you know, their fasting, uh, the feeling that they have for, you know, their body's feeling uh, during fasting, like, is it a good idea to say, okay, I ate this for suhoor and this is how I felt? Like, maybe does that, do you think that could help people's health? I think it can help people be much more conscious of the connection between food and your body, right? Mm -hmm. Most yeah. people are not aware of that connection, right? So right. I have this experience off or hear this experience often when I do, uh, you know, a group sugar detox, right? And people mm -hmm. are like, oh, I didn't realize like when, every time I ate this, I was getting a headache. Like it wasn't that I had yeah. headache because of all of this other things. It's actually what I was eating, right? Because- right. We tend to, a lot of people will have food sensitivities that they ignore because it's not an anaphylactic allergy, right? If right, you right. have yes, you know you have a severe reaction if you eat grains. If you are allergic to peanuts, you know, right, you're allergic to peanuts. Mm -hmm. But when you're eating, you know, corn oil or vegetable oil, and then a few hours later, you have a slight little headache or you can't focus on what you're we're supposed to be doing most people don't connect those two things together right, right so right, i right. always think that it's a great idea if you not not when you're not that you're sick but you feel you know when your body feels off and yeah. you're trying to figure out what it is keeping a food journal is going to be essential because after about two weeks you're going to be able to connect the dots oh look every time i 
drink milk. I This happens. Every time I eat bread, this happens, right? All of that is going to be really, really important. I diagnosed my daughter's uh, um, gluten sensitivity before her doctor diagnosed it because I was really conscious of when you eat this, you're having this symptoms. Oh, okay. Right. I think this is gluten, right? You right. want to pay attention to that kind of things, even among with your kids who are not going to connect those two things together. So right. and with this life, it's just hard sometimes, you know, it's hard to pay attention because especially when you, when you grab for boxes of things that are processed foods, right? Because a pizza is not just a pizza anymore unless you make it yourself. But right. if you say, you know, oh, I ate this and then hours later, but what was in all of that? <laughs> right? Right. right. So it's a really good idea to, to kind of, you know, I always tell people like try to cook and know exactly what you're putting in your body. Try to avoid the processed stuff because it makes diagnosing a lot of that stuff easier too. Yeah. yeah for sure. um, and, you know, just a self-awareness. It, it's, it really can, you know, change a lot. So, so, you know, you talk about the, the, the foods that uh, the fat and the protein and you know, giving us energy, but what if people say, well, that's all great and good, but I want to stay, I have to work, you know, 12 hours today and I have a, a labor intensive job. How can I stay full, fullest, the longest? What would you recommend for people like that? So if you have a really labor intensive job, and I also recommend this for people who are like uh, fitness uh, uh, um, veterans who's really focused on muscle building, there is a supplement called cre um, casein protein, right? So mm -hmm. a lot of people are familiar with whey protein. Casein protein is another milk derived uh, protein powder. And it's actually really good when you're fasting because it actually has a delayed release, right? So it shows that it can actually continue to feed your muscles for up to eight, sometimes 12 hours. So oh, wow. one of the things, so I'll, I'll give you guys a little bit of what I am going to do this Ramadan in order to help that is I, nor on a regular basis, I would have a, a whey protein shake, right? But during Ramadan, I mix half whey and half casein protein together because it's going to give me immediate protein for my muscles to use. And then the casein protein becomes a delayed feeding of my muscles. And it's also going to be more energy throughout your day, right? And so if you are have a really labor intensive, I mean, this is probably not necessary if you're like a secretary, you have a desk job, or you're not doing anything physically active during the day. So you can save some money and not go do all of this. But <laughs> if in a situation like that, you have a really labor intensive job and you still want to fast, I would definitely recommend that for Sahur, you try a combination between whey and casein protein to give you a prolonged release for protein throughout your systems and your muscles, give you more energy for a longer period of the day. So it's like a slow release, right? So yes. you're eating it, maybe you have it at Suhoor, but then it doesn't kick in until later on in the day. It starts releasing cool. slowly, slowly and feeding your muscles throughout your entire day, mostly, wow. most of your day. Yeah. That's really interesting. Maybe you can, um, when this is over, you can uh, provide a link to something that you use and that would really help. I, I that's, the, that's the first time I'm hearing this. Hmm. Uh, yeah. I've never, ever, I've always kind of wondered and asked around, but I never got an answer like that. That's there, there really isn't a, a, and just, to preempt a question, there really isn't a food that does the same thing as a casein protein does, right? Mm -hmm. Most food is going to max four hours, it's done digesting, right? Even if you ate, you know, chicken or a burger for a sahur, mm -hmm. and four hours is done digestion. But casein protein has a very unique ability to give you prolonged protein release. You have to wonder how they did it back in the day, mm -hmm. right? When when people were working outside in the hot sun. I mean, I see it now when I see people working outside um, in the heat and it's Ramadan. And I think, I mean, I wonder if there are Muslims who are fasting and that. And, you know, I, 
in thinking about this and what I know just in general about how our body adapts, right? One of the differences between our lifestyle today and we don't even have to go back as far as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam right it, certainly during his time but even if we went back 300 years when people actually farmed people actually were more metabolically flexible so metabolic flexibility mm -hmm. is when your body actually has the ability to switch from using carbohydrates as a fuel to actually using stored fat as a fuel. So when you have metabolic flexibility and you go without food, it is actually not much of a burden. You don't feel a uh, hunger and issue, right? So this is something like when people go on a ketogenic diet or they do um, extended intermittent fasting over a long period of time, the body gets used to actually not having carbohydrates, not having food, and you actually can just burn your natural body fat and consumed fat for energy, and it actually isn't very taxing. One of the reasons why we, most people actually get really fatigued, hungry is because we lack metabolic flexibility and we're so dependent on carbohydrates. And one in three Americans have insulin resistance, which makes it even harder for your body to tap into fat as a fuel source. And so there is always a struggle with Ramadan and going without eating because our body can't tap into the stored fat that we actually have that's designed to be our backup fuel source. So it's much easy, it was much easier for them back then because they had much, they have more metabolic flexibility than most people have today. Well, when you say metabolic flexibility, do you mean that they were just overall healthier eating like real foods, whole foods, no, uh, metabolic flexibility is literally your body's ability to choose which energy source it uses for fuel. So our body can use two sources of energy, only two. We can either use carbohydrates, which is what most people use as a source of energy, or we can use fat that we turn into ketones and use that as an energy source. The issue with metabolic flexibility is, well, as I, I think this is maybe my first time saying this, <laughs> that one in three Americans have some form of insulin resistance. Right. One of the effects of insulin resistance is the inability for your body to actually tap into stored fat and turn it into ketones for energy, right? It mm -hmm. actually longer to do that it is harder to do that that is a switch right so somebody with metabolic flexibility if they ate carbohydrates they can use it as energy if they go without any carbohydrates or even without any food the body is like okay i don't have carbs let me just get some fat and i'm going to use that as energy that's about bio flexibility right that's the ultimate goal that everybody should be aiming for to have your body to have the ability to switch between the two most people cannot. Most people are not metabolically healthy, right? We've done now. This is a new term that the researchers are actually looking at Americans and say, how many people are actually metabolically healthy? That means that mm -hmm. are not. So metabolic metabolic health has been defined as somebody who is not overweight, do not have um, have a healthy LDL, a healthy HDL, no high high regular high blood pressure or normal high blood pressure and not on any medication for any form of insulin resistance. Somebody that's not on any of those things. And they found that most Americans actually cannot check off all of those boxes. So somebody may say, well, I don't have diabetes. I'm not on medication for that. I don't have high blood pressure, but I'm 50 pounds overweight. Takes you out of the box, right? I don't, I'm not overweight. I don't have diabetes, but I am on medication for my cholesterol. Takes you out of the box. That's not metabolically healthy. You can say, I'm not overweight. I don't have diabetes. I don't have high blood, I don't have uh, high cholesterol, but hey, my blood pressure is high. My doctor has me on medication. Takes you out of the box. 
Most Americans cannot check all five of those boxes. And that is one of the reasons why it is very challenging for us today to actually adopt our body to the fast of Ramadan because we lack metabolic flexibility. A hundred years ago, we had metabolic flexibility. Even during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu we know that he fasted very often. That is literally right. creating that metabolic flexibility, putting yourself in ketosis over and over again throughout the entire year. And so well, Ramadan would have been much easier. Well, and also we, we don't pay enough attention to the Sunnah fast. So Sunnah meaning that's you know the way that Prophet Sallallahu used to do, which was Mondays and Thursdays also right. outside right. of Ramadan. Right. I so that's the we fasted every single Sunnah fast, we would literally be fasting like 160 days a year. Yeah. Like that today. Imagine. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. Well, that this is absolutely fascinating. The metabolic flexibility. We have to do another conversation just on that because yeah, that's that be like cool. the achievement of optimal health when you bring yeah. all of those things together. Um, and, you know, maybe this is the Ramadan we can all kind of look at fasting as, um, you know, this way to re truly reset our bodies, not just, um, you know, well, in many ways, you know, physically, spiritually, mentally, all of that. But, but if the science is supporting everything we kind of know and believe, but didn't really understand why. Yeah, because uh, yeah, I've always, I've always thought, you know, how did they do it back in the day? They didn't have the even the variety of the foods that we have, unless they lived in the Mediterranean basin, they didn't really have in the deserts of Arabia. Right. What did they have to break their fasts. And sometimes maybe it was just a bone broth, right? Right, right. So, so it's, um, but now we look at bone broth as like this, you know, um, this nutrient dense food. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's we don't novel now, like oh novel now. $20 mm -hmm. a, a jar of it at the grocery store out here in California, yeah. like beating my head. Like what is this? You know? <laughs> but it, it, but it goes to, it goes to, uh, you know, make me think really it, it, and it's like all things in life. It's not quantity. It's quality. Yes. I'm paying attention. Uh, we, you know, we in America are really, we don't realize what goes on in other parts of the world that, you know, um, other countries, other places in the world, maybe they don't have the same variety that we do, but they mm. certainly may have nutrient dense uh, meals that are, you know, less meat, more vegetables. Um, mm. But it's, it's not the quality, it's quantity. It's the quality of what we're putting in our bodies. And so I think we, we really, we really need to, I, I think the Muslim community and those like you in health, um, have an incredible opportunity to shift the paradigm of the American mindset and uh, focus on nutrition and the way we eat in this country mm -hmm. through our, maybe, maybe, maybe it's through our, um, you know, Islamic values, but there are things that everyone can benefit from when it comes to the fasting and the Ramadan and the, the whole concept of, of food Absolutely. that we, wish. and we as Muslims really need to re, you know, re, um, revive those kinds of things. We need to re-educate ourselves on what those are because I don't, I think a lot of it is lost. Just go to any community iftar and look at the, the, the type of food we're serving. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> that, right? How yeah. much junk is there? And it's yeah. like, you're, you're putting your body in this beautiful uh, fasting mode and then break the fast with a lot of junk. No. That's not. Yeah, so we, we kind of reverse it, right? All the right. things we had that. during the day. Yeah. <laughs> so, so inshallah, we, this Ramadan, may we all make the intentions of uh, continuing to eat in a healthy manner, so that we can not just get the physical, the spiritual benefits of Ramadan, but the physical benefits of Ramadan, which will further enhance our spiritual benefit because we'll have. Right more energy in order to uh, pray to for total weave, for uh, Kiyamu Layl, to actually mm -hmm. get up in the morning and actually mm -hmm. do our uh, eat sahur, right? Because sometimes we're yeah. so exhausted we can't even get up to eat sahur. So hopefully right. we can 
focus on doing that and not, and I'm not going to say throw away all of the cultural nuances, but no, no, those are fun. Sometimes we overindulge. So maybe we can pull back. Right. So I had a, um, the other day I was telling um, one interviewer, I was like, you know, maybe choose between the samosa or the biryani. Right. You don't not both. I have to admit when my Pakistani friends invite me, for, I'm like, oh, yes, because I don't make that food typically. And it's the only time of year I ever really get it. But when you're <laughs> eating it every day. That no, might no. be <laughs> excuse me. No, that 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 doesn't work. But uh, but I I do enjoy every every uh -huh. once a, once a year. It's it's good. It's good. I like. And you know, this is a time for everybody to kind of look at their traditional foods, their comfort foods, and people want those. But uh, again, everything in moderation. That is our dean, right? Yeah. Everything in moderation. So. Uh, Mubaraka, this has been so enlightening. I have learned so much. I took pages of notes from a lot of things you said, so I can hopefully reiterate them for um, uh, the, the post that I'll write about and, and insert your video, um, but your interview, but um, you have really enlightened us and shared so much of your knowledge and wisdom. You are a true gem and our Oma, and I appreciate you so much. Thank, Thank you for your time. And you. uh, you're welcome. Is there anything else you want to say? Any other tips that you think that you can leave us with that will help us get the most of our Ramadan? Um, no, you know what? I think that the two, the things that we talked about, if people apply them, then inshallah, it will be really beneficial during this entire month. You know, make sure that you are drinking your water. I'm not saying don't drink water. Right, Focus right. on that protein and fat during the sahur. Don't feel obligated for it to be a traditional breakfast. And really just curtail some of the sweets and processed foods and things like that, right? So, you know, eat more wholesome foods. And inshallah, with that, you'll be able to get both the physical and spiritual benefit of the month. Such great advice, mashallah. Thank you so, so much. And let everybody know where we can, we can they can all find you uh, on online. You're very active. So sh can you share your, your social medias? Yep. So fit Muslima everywhere. I'm very easy because I have the same <laughs> username everywhere. F I T M U S L I M A H. There's an H I at the end. My website is the same thing. Fit .com. So any of that will get me, get in touch with me. <laughs> okay. Yes. I did post, I, I did share your Instagram reels that you, uh, uh, wow. talked about the fat and protein and also about the water. So people can watch those and and follow you there. And one last thing, you mentioned you have clients. Can you tell us like what uh, what services you provide that maybe people might be interested in uh, working with you and how they can connect with you about that? Absolutely. So I do uh, group and coaching programs for women, particularly to help women to lose weight, break sugar addiction, and reverse insulin resistance. That is what I do in terms of health and wellness. During the month of Ramadan, I do a mindset course, master class specifically for women dealing with goal setting, positive psychology so that we can align our goals with our soul. You can Love find that. all the information on my social media. Um, and I am very active on Instagram and Facebook. So you can always DM me in either of those places for any questions. Perfect. You are a true, true gem. Thank you so much for being here with us. And you have a wonderful Ramadan with your beautiful family. And inshallah, we will reconnect afterwards and hopefully continue these conversations because I think there's so much here that we can even expand on. So Definitely. inshallah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. So I hope this was beneficial for people and we will talk soon. Inshallah. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.